force and the authorities contain many contradictions and they give more questions than answers. We would like to ask, was the MH370 tragedy an accident or an unprecedented event or is it related to human error? While we are unable to bring back that plane, it is worth exploring how we could have done things differently. And we put this question to our three panelists tonight. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for tonight. Our first speaker for tonight is uh, Mr. Lam Chung Wa. Mr. Lam is a senior fellow at REFSA. He holds a Bachelor of Engineering from USF and a Master's degree in Strategic and Defense Studies from UM. Well, making too much criticism has uh, earned him a uh, reward. Uh, he was blacklisted by MINDEF in 2012. And uh, he thinks that this is a compliment instead of an insult. Uh, so before joining REFSA, Mr. Lam was also an editor with The Rocket, as well as a, a defense reporter. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Lam. Before Mr. Lam gets into his presentation, we might as well introduce the rest of the speakers. Uh, our second speaker is Mr. Tommy Thomas. He is a <laughs> Mr. Thomas is a constitutional lawyer who has over 36 years of legal experience under his belt. He was called to the Malaysian Bar in 1976. Apart from being a lawyer, Mr. Thomas is also interested in corporate governance issues. He was formerly a director of the Malaysian Institute of Corporate Governance and was appointed to the United Nations Development Plan, UNDP, as to lead the Corporate Governance Initiative for Asian countries affected by financial and economic crisis of 1997. Mr. Thomas is currently representing the Penang State Government in Federal Court in a bid to restore local government elections. And uh, our final speaker for the night uh, needs no introduction. <laughs> Mr. Lim is a lawyer by profession, a politician, was first elected in 1969, an ex-ISA determinee, twice over. He is the author of 34 books and an active Twitter user. Over the past four decades, Mr. Lim has been very vocal on a range of social political issues, ranging from corruption to good governance, and he has spoke, always spoken out without fear or favor. I'm sure he will do so again tonight. With that, it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. Lam to deliver his remarks. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Good evening to everyone. Uh, in the first place, I want to thank uh, all Kata Media and the uh, LOSA staff who made uh, this event a success and then to make this event also. Uh, MH370 is the hottest, hottest topic in Malaysia currently. I think everyone uh, has, has one question. Where did it go? What was happening there? And uh, why our government acted in kind of the uh, different way that uh, other than uh, international standards and things like that. Many hanky hanky, many things. The people are demanding a lot of uh, answers from the government, but it seems that the government turned the ear and the one who reveal much more information to the public. But however, by taking information one inch by one inch, we, we manage to get the clearer picture a little bit by little bit. So this is the objective that we want to do uh, this forum tonight. We are here, we want to provide kind of alternative opinions about this tragedy. We we hope we can shoot some light of this uh, tragedy also. Yeah, in my presentation, I'm going to present uh, the whole scenario from two perspectives. 
one is from an ethical perspective, another one is from an institutional, institutional reform perspective also. Uh, let me begin. There are so many doubts. Doubts still remain. There are still many unanswered questions. They are still there. Now, new doubts have emerged after the reason make more remarks. More remarks make more questions arise. Uh, I will go one by one questions and answers also my own predictions and my own analysis also. Uh, the first question is uh, other, other than this, this question I, I, I won't raise up uh, the, the uh, old questions uh, which has been answered by the authority and uh, already answered by the press or things like that I want to raise some questions okay. the MH370 file across Pakistura I think this, this question is very very important the government according to, to my knowledge uh, the government until today they don't admit that uh, they are the MH370 is full through peninsula, northern part of Malaysia. The answer given by them was very, very clear and very, very uh, unclear. In the first few weeks, uh, the authority kept silence on the questions of whether or not the plane turned back and flew across peninsula Malaysia. They just mentioned about few points only. They said the plane flew through. Uh, several navigation waypoints such as Igali, Wempi, Igas, and Jiwa, which you can find them all from uh, internet. This is the, the chart given by the authority. From the first Igali to Wempi, Jiwa, and Igas. Initially, from this chart, you can see that MH370 it did not fly through peninsula and the government didn't give any explanation about that also. But however, after the people, the members of families, international media, the press, they gave a lot of pressure on the authority and finally they reviewed the final part of MH370. You can see it from here. Actually, it did fly through peninsula Malaysia. You can see, uh, it's, it's not very clear on the slide, but uh, you can saw, uh, you, can, you can see some uh, lines there. Okay, this is the, the, the fundamental thing. However, we have another map provided by Australian for Safety Bureau. This map is much more clearer than the map provided by our Malaysian Authority. You can see. Plane, it flew to uh, the Igali point and then it make a new turn. Make, make a new turn. And then the, the turning point is quite. Uh, it turned left and then it flew through Kota Balu and then to Penang and then vanished. The last primary radar at the uh, international time is uh, 18 point. Uh, Second. Combine these two maps, then we can get some a uh, little bit clearer piece about it. The authority they kept on they keep on to avoid to mention anything about the blink delay radar. Unfortunately, we Malaysians don't have the privilege to have a view on the snapshot or about any information about the blink delay radar. But however, members of family in China, they had the privilege to see this map. This map was presented by our Malaysian Air Force in Beijing. We don't have the uh, privilege to see it in Malaysia. You, you can see Penang is over here, and then it flew to, to the, the last point, and then vanished. Okay, this is a chart, I got it from uh, Sky Vector is uh, on my website. You can you can see so many lines on the chart. The lines represent the flight path of various uh, international flights. 
if you want to fly from Malaysia to Beijing, you want to fly from here to Bangkok, fly from here to Jakarta, every flight path is fixed. There is no alternate flight path unless there is some kind of emergency things happen. Up. So everything is fixed. I presented here because I will let you see another slide also. I overlay this chart with the previous map that you will see another story. See. You can, you can see the line, the yellow color line is overlapping with the five path, the established five path. Why? Why was it happen in this way? Why? There are some questions that have to be answered also. The flying path seems to be somewhat in accordance with the established flight path. My guess. First, perhaps the plane encountered uncontrollable technical failures, which led the air crews to decide to turn back. And then they managed, they did have some time to change the wing, their waypoints. They didn't fly the aircraft by manually. They did manage to control the FMS, which is flight management system. This is the first case scenario. And the second case is the airplane might be hijacked by someone. And it was deliberately steal from its original cost. And these are the two facts that we have to determine. But uh, it seems that the authority still don't want to review so much about information about the, the, the guessing of this. Yeah. Second point is the IMH370 flew through Aceh, Indonesia, under Aceh. You can see from the map. But did the Indonesian air defense radar detect the airplane? It's very crucial. According to the Indonesian Daily Jakarta Post report, Indonesian radar at Lok Siu Mavi did not pick up the airplane. The, radar, the radar's detection range is around 400 km. But where is Lok Siu Mavi? Let's see. Lok Siu Mavi is around there. You can see that the, uh, the radar detection is very, very vast and wide. It already covered the whole area. And I overlap this map again with the previous map. You can see. So within this radar detection range, Android 370 is under Indonesian radar detection. But why Indonesian air defense system, the air commander, they said it didn't detect Android 370? If Indonesian Air Force radar didn't pick up image 370, why is the first question? And will this affect the ultimate estimate and the flight path of image 370? Does it mean that the image 370 didn't fly, it didn't fly to Indonesia or it fly to another place? We don't know. And second, Cocos Islands. According to the flight path provided by the authority, also, it flew to almost uh, very close to Cocoa Island, Island, nearly less than 100 kilometers away, uh, kilometers away only. If Cocoa Islands equipped with air defense radar, perhaps Australia can provide some more information. This is what I guess. And also, according to my knowledge, uh, as far as I'm concerned now, Coco Islands has one airport there, and also it has radar there also. If it has radar, then certainly Australia can uh, determine whether they have detected MH370, whether it flew to the South uh, Indian Ocean or And then questions always raised by the people. Is it possible an aircraft being hacked and under the control of hacker? Yeah, it happened before. It's true. This is an unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, 
built by America, RQ-170. This is a stealth uh, unmanned air vehicle and it uh, invaded uh, Iran in 2011. In December that year, Iraq, Iran they proved to the world that an aircraft can be hacked and it's control oriented. The aircraft landed landed in Iran by under the construction uh, instruction by uh, Iranian. They the Iranian they successfully captured the, the UAV. But that was an unmanned vehicle with no physical flight control system. Boeing 7777 is designed for a man control and has physical control mechanism. It's a different scenario. It is hard for the hacker to override the physical control system. It's easy for the hacker to override the, soft, uh, uh, the, the soft, uh, software system. Actually, hackers have proven before that actually they really can hack into the flight control system, but they cannot override the physical control system only. And in the end, the American uh, Federal Aviation Agency came out and they said it publicly that uh, they noticed this kind of the activity, but however, they overrule any possibility of an aircraft can be hacked and controlled. This, this is the first part. I talk about the uh, technical <coughs> thing. And second part is about uh, institutional reform. On paper, this tra tragedy can be ascertained and there are a lot of unknown variables of it. However, there must be a reason for the incident. There must be. Perhaps even several reasons coming together to allow the tragedy to happen. I call it as the perfect storm, just for the form of the movie. The first, first thing, we have to look into this deeply. What if it was intercepted? During the event, our uh, Air Force and Defense Minister they keep on saying that uh, MH370 it isn't a hostile target. That is why they didn't scramble their aircraft, their fighters to interject, intercept it. But how to determine an aircraft is hostile? They don't want to reveal their standards. Then we have to count on the, uh, international standards which is American standards, which is the, the highest standards in the world. According to the United States, the Federal Aviation Agency in regulations, uh, an aircraft is a threat and treated as an enemy aircraft and can be intercepted by a fighter aircraft if, number one, if it flies in or through the boundary without prior falling in its flight plan, which MH370 didn't do it, Second, the aircraft radar transponder is not operational. Yes, MH370 is switched off their transponder. Third, it doesn't maintain two-way radio contact. Yes, MH370 didn't establish any two-way contact, radio contact with the air traffic controller. So in this scenario, MH370 fulfilled these three conditions. In the American case, they certainly they will scramble their agent, their fighters to intercept it. But in Malaysia, we have this case. Comparison between MH370 and A, A France 447 is tragedy. Our defense minister always used this as an example to say that we are doing better than A France. And also the Brazilian, the uh, air traffic control also. He claims that Air France activated such and rescue operation after seven hours of loss, loss of communication, while our mass triggered such and rescue just after four hours. We did better than them. But did we really do better? There are several facts that needs to be distinguished before we make a comparison. This uh, uh, time schedule, I what I did uh, for the Air France 447, I highlighted several phrases. Uh, was 
with the highlight alert, you can see that this was the last uh, contact with the echo, which happened at uh, 1 o'clock 35 minutes 38 seconds at 9. And at the 4 o'clock 20 minutes 27 seconds, Brazilian they sent a message to Air France so that an air like that, that Air France to try to contact uh, Air France at uh, 4 o'clock 80 minutes. And then at 5 o'clock 33 minutes, uh, air traffic controller in Brazil that triggered the search and rescue. 5 o'clock 33 minutes. And at 8 o'clock sharp, Air France Operation Control uh, Center they set up a crisis group. So I, I did some summary about it. Air France 447 took off from Brazil on 31st May 2009 and vanished when crossing the Atlantic Sea at 2.14 a.m. 1st of June. The flight until the moment it vanished was under Brazilian air traffic control jurisdiction before passing the flight control to Dakar, Senegal, which is an African country. We, it's more important for us to, screen, to, to scrutinize Brazilian response, responses, responses and reactions than Air France itself. Why? Because the aircraft was under Brazilian jurisdiction. There is no point to blame Air France. But this is what our Hisham Moudin is doing right now. He's blaming Air France, but he didn't look at the Brazilian response. So, by analyzing the timelines of both events, Brazil, it, it took 3 hours and 48 minutes precisely to initiate such a rescue process. But Malaysia took 4 hours 11, 11 minutes, which is longer than Brazil also. So, did Hisham Moudin realize this fact? I think he should do a little bit homework before he say anything. The third point is immigration security screen failure. The failure of the Malaysian airport security to link up with the Interpol database had allowed the true undocumented Iranians to onboard the aircraft. This shouldn't be this shouldn't happen, but it happened. A blur zone. What I call is a blur zone. Uh, the aircraft it turned back at Igadi Point, which is a, a boundary between Malaysia Air Traffic Control and Vietnamese Air Traffic Control. Within the, in, in this point, Malaysia will pass the control uh, the authority to Vietnamese Air Traffic Control, and Vietnamese they will uh, take over the uh, the control uh, authority from Malaysia. In the event, in, in this event. Malaysia thought that we have passed the MH370 to Vietnam. But however, Vietnam thought that MH370 was still in the jurisdiction of Malaysia. And that is why they wasted so much time communicating with each other to ask whether the aircraft was in your place or not, the aircraft was still in your place or not. They keep on exchanging their messages if you follow this case. And then, it took more than three hours to clarify that yes, that aircraft was not in your place, neither in your place also. It flew away already. Number five, uh, where is the professionalism? Since 1995, when the last mass avian tragedy happened, in this last 19 years, mass and the Malaysian Department of Civil Aviation have not faced any serious aircraft incident. Is it the reason that our mass and our authority cannot handle this incident good or in a well manner? They handle it in very, very bad manner in terms of our the, uh, public relationship, public relations also, in terms of handling the whole case, the search and rescue process also, they did it very badly. So I think they have to restore their professionalism. Six. Why isn't there an independent air accident investigative bureau in Malaysia? In US, 
UK and France, they have a very, very uh, developed aviation industry. They have specialized departments. They have specialized depart departments to investigate aircraft incidents. This we can understand. It's very normal for them because they have very, very advanced air, air uh, manufacturing, aircraft manufacturing industry. But even a small country such as Singapore, Thailand, and Mongolia, they also have their own and it's accident investigation video. But does Malaysia have it? Or is it important to have it? Yes, my answer is yes. It's very important to have it because we have the biggest regional low-cost uh, airliner hub in Malaysia. We have more air traffic than Singapore. You have more air traffic than Mongolia. You have more air traffic than Thailand. So why we don't have a specific or independent air accident investigative bureau? Currently, we have one air security division under our DCA, Department of uh, Civil Aviation. But that unit doesn't have any skill, doesn't have any capabilities, or doesn't have the uh, equipment to investigate uh, any very, very big or small aircraft air, air accidents. I think we should really need to think about this thing. And my final thing is about what is the truth? Everyone is demanding the truth. And the members of families, they deserve the truth. My, my humble request is, Please set up a royal function to investigate the whole thing, the whole scenario. This is the only way for you to restore your um, reputation and your authority also. And besides this, you, the government, and also the authority have to go back to your know, institutional institutional weaknesses and correct it and also improve it also. And the technical failures I mentioned just now also, I think we have to establish one air accident investigative period. If we do have one, then we don't need to count on Australia so much. Right now, we count on Australia to do the whole, whole thing for us, on behalf of us, including search and rescue the aircraft, and also investigating the thing also. And also, uh, the authority has set up one international technical uh, investigating team, which is led by our former DCA chief. But however, the team is going to look for the technical failure or the technical perspective on it. They, I don't think they are going to look into the institutional failures. I think they have to be reminded in this way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lam. Certainly raised a lot of questions about the technical and institutional failures. We would like to hear more about this. May I invite the second speaker, Mr. Tommy Thomas, to share his views on today's topic. Thank you very much for the ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me share my thoughts on the MH370 tragedy. For weeks after the disappearance of the plane, on 8th of March, various governmental authorities claimed that there should be no public discussion as a mark of respect for families of those on board. I suggest that what... Oh, that one is for our recording mic. Oh, I see. Okay. I suggest that what the families have wanted most from the morning of 8th of March, when the plane was scheduled to land at Beijing at 6.30 a.m., is the truth and nothing but the truth. 
In order to achieve closure, they wanted facts and evidence. They have never received facts or evidence from our government. Therefore, this forum serves an important function in trying to understand why the tragedy was wholly man-made and therefore avoidable. In a nation that is used to mattresses being brought to court to establish sodomy and immigration records being erased, the evidence that was released on MH370 on a piecemeal, selective and haphazard manner was never truthful. So if I just mention a few for you to recall, uh, the stolen passports of the Iranians, whether or, whether or not the transponders were switched off, uh, whether there was only a large quantity of mangosteens and on board, <laughs> <laughs> where, uh, what happened to the flight simulator of Captain Zahari after he was taken from his home for investigation, and most recent, the audio, uh, the audio recordings that were released together with the preliminary report on the 1st of May that was edited and tampered with uh, according to international uh, experts. So my first observation is that we cannot trust the information that was released both around the time of, uh, the, the, of the crash and most significantly on the 1st of May as being truthful. Of course, you will remember 1st of May is when they issued the preliminary report. And nonetheless, one can try to form a picture by piecing together the information, uh, however incomplete it is, that was released that day. Uh, this is like fitting some puzzles in a jigsaw. Uh, and what I propose to do is to consider the chronology of events. Would you like to adjust your microphone? It can't be heard. Uh, this, uh, I, I like to consider the chronology of events that occurred from 12.41 a.m. to 8.19 a.m. on Saturday the 8th of March. And this is essentially taken from what was released by them on the 1st of March. So you must take it with a pinch of salt because we just don't know whether it's truthful. But let's assume it's truthful. So what happens is on the 12th, at 12.41, the plane takes off from KLA, scheduled flight to Beijing, 239 persons, 227 passengers, 12 crew. And then very quickly it climbed up to 35,000 feet, nothing to report. And then at 1.19, um, uh, the last communication between KL air traffic and MH370, and somebody on board, I'm not sure whether it's the captain or the co-pilot, uh, ended the f uh, famous words, co which of course they also got it wrong for three, four weeks. Uh, but the quotes were like, the words were, quote, Good night, Malaysian 370. Uh, and then the critical event had happened, which was just two minutes later, 121, I forget about the seconds, uh, MH370 was observed on the radar screen uh, as it passed over Igeri. So there's no problem then. So what it means is if I stop there for 40 minutes, it was on the radar. So if anybody is watching it, they could see for 40 minutes, it's on the radar. And then at 1.21, uh, and here it matters, nine seconds later, the radar label for MH370 at KL Air Traffic Control disappeared from the, from the screen. And this was the first warning bell. So if anybody was sitting there and watching the radar as they ought to be doing, they should immediately say, notice, hey, I noticed this, the, the blip and now it's disappeared. Where has it gone? And, and that happened 14 minutes after the radar uh, screen picked it up and was following it. And then 17 minutes later, uh, at 1.38, Ho Chi Minh Air Traffic Control inquired from KL on the whereabouts of MH370 and, and, and that obviously tells you, as, as Mr. Lam said, Vietnam has not received the plane yet, it has not entered Vietnamese airspace. So Vietnam asks what's happened to it. So therefore, even if the guy in the KL Air Traffic Control was asleep, which is a high potential, uh, a high probability in Indonesia uh, at 121. Um, if he was asleep, he would have been awakened by the 
Ho Chi Minh Christian at 1.38. Hey, mister, where is the plane that has not entered Vietnam? And the penny should have dropped at that point of time. And I, and I suggest that if we had done what we ought to have done at 1.21 and 1.38, then we, this could have been avoided. And, I, and I'll emphasize that later when, there's a, uh, when the plane turns around. And then um, we start the, the conversation between Malaysia and uh, and Ho Chi Minh that Mr. Lam mentioned, I won't go into the details. But what is interesting is I, I suggest that even on the information released by Malaysia, it's Ho Chi Minh air traffic control that emerges as real heroes. For six times, on six separate occasions, they ask the Christian to KL, where is MH370? So they are so concerned. So what this tells me, um, um, as a trial lawyer, and I, I want to emphasize that when I'm increasing this information, this is what one would do when one has for a trial. You want evidence and you want your witnesses. What this tells you is that the Vietnamese air officers are very professional, they are very concerned, and they want to know what is happening. Whereas we have a sleepy bunch. And that's be polite. And then somewhere along the line, we say he's gone into Cambodia. And, and I don't know, and of course, I don't know where they got that information. Uh, they claim Mars told them this is in Cambodia. And they tell this to Vietnam. And then Vietnam, or Ho Chi Minh doesn't believe it. And then Ho Chi Minh does the extra thing, which we never did. Ho Chi Minh contacted Cambodia. And Cambodia says, we don't know what you're talking about. And Ho Chi Minh then replies to Kuala Lumpur saying, it's not in Cambodia. Uh, so that so in a sense, it's laughable. It's, in many ways, in there, not in deaths, it's a, it's a farce. And then, uh, after some time, uh, while this exchange between the lady, the KL and uh, Ho Chi Minh is going on, we then, uh, we KL say, well, if you start in Cambodia, KL asking Ho Chi Minh, uh, do you think you could have gone to Hong Kong or Beijing? <laughs> and then, no, and I, think, I guess the guy in Ho Chi Minh must have been laughing and said, look, these this people are lunatics. <laughs> you know, it hasn't even come to Vietnam, how is he going to fly across to Beijing? <laughs> you know, because it was, it was just unbelievable. Uh, and then we are, then we finally wake up and at 5.09 we are Singapore. And I mean, if you, like, if you check the map, Singapore is south of Malaysia and not here, and the Russian plane is going in the north. So all this is tells you it's a real uh, uh, comical farce, but of course life's at stake. Um, and then at 520, and this is very interesting, uh, information released by our, our people, they caught an unnamed captain, must be a Malaysian captain, and he was asked at 520, what's happened to MH370? And his answer at 520, 5.20 he says, MH370 has never left Malaysian airspace. <laughs> Which means that it's been in Malaysia for six or five hours. I mean, that's quite an extraordinary thing that is true for you. You've got to check. So if, if we went to trial, the lawyers would be asking you questions about this, the ones who need who this captain is. And then, uh, again, Ho Chi Minh for the sixth time asks about us. Um, and, and then at 6.14, remember the plane is scheduled to land at 6.30. It's a six hour flight. It's 12.30 to 6.30. Um, at 6.14, Kale, Kale, uh, air traffic asks Ho Chi Minh, have you had search and rescue been activated? And again, this is shocking. Sorry, the plane is a Malaysian plane. It's leaving Malaysia, and our chums are asking Vietnam, have you done search and rescue? So I think if we interviewed the Vietnamese air traffic controllers, I don't know how many were there, they will say, look, we just cannot believe it. We, we are, are we watching a film or what? Why are we doing search and rescue? It's your Malaysian plane. What evidence is there is crashed at Vietnam? And that's how, how silly it was. And then 6.30, as I told you, it was scheduled to land. And then at 8.19, the last satellite communication, the famous handshake, which we discovered later, at 8.19, which suggests that the plane was still flying, because all the scientists say that, that can, the handshake can only happen if the plane is on, above and not on the ground. So it's still flying somewhere at 8.19. So um, I've already 
I already said about uh, that Ho Chi Minh comes out as, he, as heroes, and can you believe it? We've got uh, our authorities have the cheek. Um, when some international observers noticed how fantastic Vietnam was performing, uh, around the 3rd or 4th of May, our DCA definitely, and I think probably Shang Hui also, started criticizing Vietnam. They were blaming Vietnam again, and of course Malaysians, are, our government is champion for blame because they are never ever at fault. It's always somebody else. Um, and what this tells you is on the arm, even on the information that they've released to us, there is so much gaps. So the uh, 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 45 minutes, 50 minutes when there is not a single event. And if I stop, and when you're listening to this narration, you will realize, and I'm sure all of you have flown, everybody in this uh, uh, room, I'm sure, has flown. Nothing else thanks to Tony Fernandez, since everybody else can fly. And everybody can fly. You will understand that when you're flying, even seconds matter, and minutes certainly matter, and hours certainly matter. This is a six hour flight. So it is critical that every minute or few minutes are accounted for. So there is a terrible omission in the um, information released to us so far. Then what was, what was very interesting was the press report that Gishamudin, the minister, released a press statement when the, the preliminary report came out. And I want to read this to you because this is the public domain. Uh, written by uh, 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 maybe his press secretary, but read out by the minister, and is under the heading the military's tracking of MH370. As stated previously, Malaysian military radar did track, and I'm going to add the words in real time, an aircraft making a turn back in a westerly direction across Peninsula Malaysia on the morning of 8th of March. The aircraft was categorized as friendly by the radar operator and therefore no further action was taken at the time. The radar data was reviewed in a playback. So first time, what I just read, first paragraph is real time. Somebody actually picked it up. Then they, at 8.30, that means they now know the plane has just disappeared. It was supposed to land at 6.30. At 8.30, they review the playback and they notice this and they then send it to the Air Force operations at 9 a.m. Of course, the Air Force already know this because they, they've got their data. And then following further discussion up the chain of command, the military informed the acting transport and defense minister, Hishamurin, at approximately 10.30 a.m., so Saturday morning, of the possible turn back of the aircraft. So if I stop there, he, this, is, this must be correct, this is their statement. Hishamurin therefore has told the world, he knew at 10.30 on Saturday of the turning back of the plane. And the minister, he then informed the Prime Minister, who immediately ordered that search and rescue operations be initiated in the Straits of Malacca, that is consistent with turning back, along with South China Sea, which is totally cockeyed. <laughs> so, I, I can't understand why they spent one week and told the whole world it is south of Vietnam and South China Sea, when they knew that morning it had turned back. That is one of the, and in fact, I'm surprised these countries, well, they may have said quite diplomatic notes, but they should have publicly criticized Malaysia and said, why did you waste our resources when, when you knew, when you yourself knew at 10.30 the plane had turned back? So that uh, takes you into the questions that uh, call out for answer. And these questions again, rely to some extent on the information that I just read you, I again preface it by saying I don't trust this information. I don't know whether it's truthful. But on the assumption it's truthful, these are the questions that all we should ask. Uh, why did not the KL air traffic control, upon discovering the radar signal for the, the plane, had disappeared at 121, and also certainly when Ho Chi Minh told them at 138, that MH had not entered the Vietnamese airspace, why did not air, KL air traffic control inform all the other authorities? They should have told the Air Force, the military, DCA, police and mass. In other words, when you find this out, surely the protocol is not for you to keep quiet and do nothing. 
you should do something about it. And there must be protocol. They must be trained to say what happens when these things occur. Secondly, when and where the MH, the plane, execute the turn back, because we know there's a turn back. And then, uh, uh, for how long after it carried out the turn back was the plane in Malaysian airspace, both as a matter of time and also distance? I say that because you remember what I told you the captain. Some captain says uh, the plane was in Malaysian airspace at 5 o'clock. That I think is extreme, which means it's just circling around um, Malaya. Uh, and that's, I mean, but, it, but somebody said that. We want to know how long. Then, of course, you will remember that our papers were carrying stories that MH370, this is after they accepted that the plane had turned back. Our papers say that MH370 had dropped its altitude from 35,000 feet, which was what we were supposed to be flying at cruising speed, to 5,000 feet when flying over parts of Peninsula Malaysia. So did that happen? And if so, why did a plane drop from 35 to 5,000? And then also the newspapers around, around the time were saying that the co-pilot tried to establish contacts through his mobile phone while the plane was flying low over Penang. And did that happen? If so, was he successful? Did he contact anybody? Did he, was it his mother or girlfriend or neighbor or what? What happened? Because that's important, because that also seems to suggest that the co-pilot may have been locked out. He knows something is uh, happening, whether it's hijacked or a pilot or whatever. He must answer this question. Then we come, come to the, uh, deter, the decision by the radio operator in the early hours of 6th March, when he says that the unidentified aircraft was friendly. Now, this is shocking. I mean, you don't have to be a technical person to know that the radar, they, they don't, they don't be, they won't be crying out and say, I am friendly, I am friendly, or something else blipping and say, I am an enemy, I am an enemy. You have to assume everything that you don't know of is an enemy. In fact, the, the, in fact, because Malaysia is not at war, you have to assume that there will be no enemy plane in your airspace because they are not at war. So it, it might, you have to be more guarded about a friendly aircraft because what may seem to be a friendly aircraft could be disguised as a friendly aircraft and actually could be coming to uh, hit the Prime Minister's office in Putrajaya or somewhere, I don't know, or KLCC or whatever. You know. So why did they suddenly say it's friendly? And then even after this, this chum decided it was a friendly aeroplane, why did the authorities still do nothing? Why did the authorities not put two and two together and say, hey, we know that MH370 is missing and we, we have an un unidentified plane on the radar. So you don't have to have a Harvard MBA, you don't have to have a PhD from Imperial College London to put the two and two to, uh, together and say, hey, presto, this missing plane, is this on the radar? Because surely this can't be happening in the evening. So I'm stunned that they didn't do that. And now, the most important question as to why they could have saved it, which is why did not the Air Force scramble its jet fighters to intercept and force MH370 to land? And that is their critical answer. And that question was asked of the Transport Minister by the Australian Program Four Corners. And his, his unbelievable answer was, what, do you expect us to shoot the plane down? <laughs> but that, that again tells you how wrong he, 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 his grasp of his office is and the purpose of going and intercepting. The purpose of going to intercept, and he said, essentially what happens is two Air Force planes will, will go, one on the left hand side and one on the right hand side, and they will establish communications with the pilot. And they will know what's happening. And if the pilot does not respond to the Air, uh, air Force,
course, as has happened in this team, then you, you, you don't want to shoot the plane because obviously you will know it's Mars, you will know it's our own plane, and you will never, even our dummies will not shoot our plane. So you won't shoot it, but if the guy, if it's suicidal, hijacker or pilot, you will at least know immediately where the plane has crashed. Because your, your right hand and the left hand planes have seen it crashing. That is the purpose of interception, not to shoot the wretched thing as a first option. Uh, and so that is the outbreak minister's answer. And then I told you about the, uh, the South China Sea. I mean, to me, that's also a shocking lie that they could tell the world and tell them for five, seven, one whole week. Look in South China Sea when you can turn back. And that was the real lie which cost a lot of our neighbors to waste their resources. And then um, they assume now we all I think now they all seem to accept it. I think Mr. Lam, if I asked you, would you accept as a fact that it's turned back? I can. Yeah. Okay, so on the assumption, because I'm still not, I must feel hundred percent sure. But everybody seems to accept that it's turned back. So let's assume it turned back. Then why do you say, why are they so sure it went south, turned left to Australia, rather than turn right and up north? They go up to Pakistan, Tashkent and all that. I mean, I'm not so convinced about the reasoning as to why uh, they are looking down rather than up. And then most importantly, when it comes to the Imazat uh, um, information, why was our Prime Minister, and I think Kitsia will no doubt be able to answer this since they, they get on very well and they know each other very well. <laughs> Why, what facts did our Prime Minister have apart from Imazat's opinion when he suddenly announced on the 24th of March, and I remember watching it was about 10 o'clock at night on TV because he wanted to get premiere time in London and New York. 10 p.m. he came in on CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, when he said the quote, MH370, quote, had ended, unquote, in the South China Sea. Had ended. Indian Ocean. So, so, from, from the Indian Ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, had ended. Yeah. Now, of course, that is a silly thing to do because you know immediately the families are not going to accept it. The families are going to say, quite rightly, where is the proof? We want to see the uh, play. And we want to see the dead bodies. We are not going to accept anything. So anybody advising the Prime Minister will say, look, please don't make that announcement. You have no proof. And of course, now looking back, two and a half months later, there's still no proof. So it just tells you how what a silly, silly statement that was. But then this Prime Minister is used to doing silly things. <laughs> Then a bit later, suddenly there was a discussion that it was off the waters of Bangladesh. Can you remember that? Some Australian company said that their scientific research says it's off Bangladesh. And I think the Bangladesh Navy went and looked for things. Not that one has any confidence in the Bangladesh Navy. They are all probably Malaysia. <laughs> but anyway, that, I think what happened to that? And then cargo, cargo manifests. Uh, the, Disclose information is there's mangosteens, there's lithium batteries. So if we stop at lithium batteries first, the lithium batteries that they are, that they told us, assuming it's truthful, is 2,400 kgs or 5,400 pounds. And it's being carried in a passenger aircraft as opposed to cargo. Because actually you can book a, a, a DHL and all this cargo, you can book it and then you can put all these batteries there. But we had this amount. That is a bit dangerous, so we need to have explanation. Then there is also another cargo which and I, I can't say how many items there are because they just put it as unidentified cargo. It could be one item or it could be 200 items. We just don't know what it is. And that is 6,400 pounds or 2,900 uh, kg. So essentially, it's tons of materials were taken on this plane which should not be taken on a passenger plane. So questions can, can be asked on that. And then can I, I, I'm going to put forward some suggestions which may be absolutely controversial. <laughs> Because we cannot accept the integrity of the information and the truth of the information, can I suggest two things which hasn't come out to the public domain? 
what, how do we know that the captain, if the captain is the cause, because that is one theory, how do we know that the captain did not actually fill up his plane and I checked with